Две. Одна. Ноль. On October 30, 1961, after 16 years of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombed, it was a display of power beyond imagination, an ominous testament to the Cold War's nuclear arms race. The world held its breath as the two giants played a dangerous game of nuclear chess. But in the midst of this chilling brinkmanship, one weapon emerged that would rewrite the rules of engagement, a weapon so unimaginable that it defied comprehension. This is the story of the Tsar Bomba, a name etched in the shadows of secrecy and the reasons behind Russia's decision to declassify its documentary on this terrifying project. Tensions between the USSR and the United States had escalated to a fevered pitch. It was the 1950s, a time when the United States had an undeniable nuclear advantage over the USSR. But the Soviets were not sitting idly by. They had developed thermonuclear weapons and were determined to find a way to deliver them effectively. The stakes were high. A realistic retaliatory strike against the US seemed nearly impossible. Also, there were no effective means of delivering nuclear warheads to the U.S. both in the 1950s and in 1961. The USSR was therefore not able to muster a possible realistic retaliatory nuclear strike against the U.S. The United States had a monopoly on nuclear weapons, and the Soviets were terrified that they would be wiped out in a nuclear attack. Soviet leaders, Georgi Malenkov and Nikita Khrushchev, were facing a grave threat. They urgently needed a deterrent to dissuade the United States from ever using its nuclear arsenal. Their covert plan, codenamed Project 602 or AN602, began to take shape. To maintain secrecy, they used multiple names, leading to confusion even within the intelligence community. It would later be known as Dar Bomba, with a playful nickname, Kuzka's mother, possibly referring to Khrushchev's vow to show the United States. Other nicknames included Big Ivan, Project 7000, and Product Code 202. Across the ocean, the CIA watched closely, designating the test as JOE-111 as part of their nuclear test counting scheme. The development of this superweapon started in 1956 in two stages. The first, from 1956 to 1958, focused on Product 202, developed within NII-1011. Work on NII-1011 began later than desired, posing challenges. In the second phase, from 1960 to the successful tests in 1961, Item 602 was meticulously crafted at KB-11 under VB Adamski's guidance. It involved the contributions of notable scientists like Andrei Sakharov, Yu and Babayev, Yu and Wen Smirnov, and Yu Atrutnev. In this chilling atmosphere, a clandestine group of Soviet physicists, led by the enigmatic Andrei Sakharov, embarked on a diabolical endeavor, the creation of the Tsar Bomba. As the Soviets pushed forward with their audacious plan to create the world's most powerful bomb, global tensions continued to soar. The world teetered on the brink of annihilation, and the tale of Tsar Bomba was just beginning. The climax of this saga, the detonation that would shake the world, was yet to come. The Tsar Bomba, officially named the ERD S220, was a tremendously powerful nuclear weapon developed by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It showcased the Soviet Union's nuclear prowess and the terrifying potential of nuclear arms. One of the major hurdles in creating the Tsar Bomba was its sheer size. Initially designed to have a colossal 100 megaton capacity, this bomb's fallout was deemed too perilous for testing. Its destructive force would have eclipsed anything seen before. To alleviate concerns, a tough decision was made. The Tsar Bomba's yield was reduced to a still staggering 50 megatons, approximately 3,800 times more powerful than the U. S bomb dropped on Hiroshima during World War II. The Tsar Bomba was a three-stage hydrogen bomb with a Trutnev Babayev second and third stage design. In this design, a fission-type atomic bomb served as the first stage to compress the thermonuclear second stage. The energy generated from this explosion then compressed the much larger thermonuclear third stage. There's evidence suggesting that the Tsar Bomba might have had multiple third stages, each more destructive than the last. In 1954, 
Soviet physicists, including Andrei Sakharov, Yakov Zeldovich, and Yuri Trutnev, developed their version of a staged thermonuclear weapon called RDS-37, just like in the United States. Some in the Soviet Union were already thinking of even more powerful bombs. KGB General Avriami P. Zavinyagin proposed a massive version of the hydrogen bomb based on the ERDS-37 design, but with substantially more fuel to achieve a yield in the many tens of megatons, possibly 20 to 30 megatons. Work began on this bomb, named RDS-202, in 1956 with design calculations carried out at Chelyabinsk 70 and procurement orders placed for the required materials. The physical size of the bomb was immense, weighing 24 to 26 tons, with a final length of 26 feet and a diameter exceeding 6 feet. Manufacturing parts for such a colossal weapon presented formidable challenges. For instance, largest front part of the casing required the assembly of 1,520 smaller elements through a parquet approach and crafting the internal spherical shapes demanded innovative manufacturing techniques. Additionally, transporting and delivering the bomb posed another obstacle due to its size. It couldn't be loaded onto any aircraft available in the Soviet Union at that time. The Tsar Bomba, or Big Ivan, was a colossal nuclear weapon with many challenges in its development and deployment. A Tu-95V bomber had to undergo significant modifications to carry this massive bomb, which was equipped with a specialized parachute. This parachute not only facilitated the bomb's release, but also allowed observer planes to retreat to a safe distance, offering a 50% survival rate. On October 30, 1961, the bomber, piloted by Andrei Durnovsev, took off from a remote Russian airstrip. It carried beneath it the largest and most powerful nuclear bomb ever created. The bomb's enormous size required the removal of the bomber's bomb bay doors and fuel tanks. It was too heavy for missiles or conventional planes designed for carrying such weapons, making the mission effectively one way. Major Andrei Durnovsev guided the aircraft to Michushika Bay, a Soviet testing range, flying at an altitude of about 34,000 feet. The bomb was equipped with a proximity fuse, ensuring its detonation only after the aircraft had reached a safe distance. Another modified bomber flew alongside, ready to capture the blast on film and monitor air samples. The bomb descended slowly to a height of 13,000 feet before detonating, while the two bombers retreated to a safe distance of nearly 50 kilometers. At 11.32 Moscow time, Tsar Bomba erupted in a colossal fireball, creating a flash visible from 1,000 kilometers away. The resulting mushroom cloud reached 64 kilometers in height an awe-inspiring sight. The consequences were catastrophic for Novaya Zemlyai, with the village of Severny entirely destroyed, even causing structural damage hundreds of miles away. Remarkably, Durnovsev's Tupolev survived, despite the blast wave forcing it to plummet over 1,000 meters before the pilot regained control. The explosion was impossible to hide, as a U.S. spy plane codenamed Speedlight was nearby, providing data to estimate the test yield. The international response was swift, with condemnation from the U.S. Britain and neighboring Scandinavian countries like Sweden. Tsar Bomba symbolized humanity's capability for both incredible achievement and devastating destruction. Although a success, Tsar Bomba was never considered for operational use. Given its size, the device could not be deployed by a ballistic missile. Instead, the bomb had to be transported by conventional aircraft, which could easily be intercepted before reaching its target. Thus, Tsar Bomba was viewed as a propaganda weapon. If you found this account of the Tsar Bomba's extraordinary story fascinating, and if you're hungry for more insights into history's most riveting moments, consider subscribing to our channel, Truth Inc. We are dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of our past and exploring the profound events that have shaped our world.